Hello and welcome to a Saturday edition of the Managing Madrid podcast. I'm your host, Keon Sobani. I'm joined today by the great Sam Leverage, the great Mehdi Hassan. We are here to talk about tomorrow's big game at the Bernabeu. Real Madrid versus Sevilla. 15th place Sevilla are coming to the Bernabeu, a place where they have not won in La Liga since 2008. I know the Sanchez Pichuan always gives us problems at the Bernabeu. It's a little bit more straightforward. I don't want to jinx it, but we are in a situation where we are heavily favored. But the big story is the prodigal son returns. The greatest center back in Real Madrid history. One of the greatest center backs in football history. Certainly, if I were to make a draft and I was drafting for a Champions League final, and I needed one center back, he's going number one on my list. Sergio Ramos is coming back. So... uh we got we got that happening. And I don't know what that means. I just know that we were very lucky that he did not score the winning header against us in the Pijuan late. I think he hit the crossbar, if I remember correctly. That was shocking that that did not hit the other side of the crossbar and actually go in. But we're here. Mehedi's here. Sam's here. Sam, we'll start with you. I know you've been watching a lot of Sevilla. You watch a ton of La Liga. Where do you, like, in terms of where they are on the table now. They've gotten themselves out of the relegation battle a little bit. They're up to 15th. How good is this team? I'm not sure how good they are, but they're definitely not as bad as they look. 15th sounds like a team that's really bad, uh, that is really struggling, but especially since Kike Sanchez Flores come in, they've really been grinding out some results. And I mean, it was only, what, two weeks ago that they beat Atletico at the pit one, and, and that's not an easy thing to do. Um, and even last weekend, they played against Valencia on, on Saturday night. And they only had one shot on target, but they kept Valencia quite quiet as well. I mean, Valencia and Mestalla this season have been pretty good as well. So I think that's going to be the real thing with Sevilla is going to be that, especially with Quique Sanchez-Flores, who's very much kind of built his whole career off of shutting teams down, is can Real Madrid find the gaps in Sevilla? Offensively, I think if Real Madrid can get one goal, then this should be relatively straightforward but getting that first goal could be a real challenge in in the first half especially if Sevilla keep things very tight sit very deep it could be a, a challenging start to the game at least Mehedi thinking hey, back to all these two thousand these these games against Sevilla at the Bernabeu since 2008 what is it that's so different could do you like do you remember like what how they approach those two games differently because I, I i've been at my fair share of games at the Bernabeu when we face sevilla and i always leave thinking well that was like an easy three deal or something like that what is it just basically a change of fortress and and the teams just act differently i know the pijuan is obviously a very intimidating place to play is there something more to it yeah, sevilla for the longest time used to be the team for some reason, La Liga fixtures are obviously made by Illuminati. So Sevilla always used to be the game after the Clasico. And I remember, I think, after Ancelotti's first Clasico in 2013, the next game was against Sevilla. And we won, like, I think, 7-3 or something. Bale scored a hat-trick. Ronaldo scored a hat-trick, something like that. So Sevilla, Sevilla always used to be that kind of a fixture, at least at the Bernabeu. But obviously, things have changed over time, and uh, neither teams are what they used to be. Madrid are obviously closer to what they used to be than Sevilla, I would I would say. Uh, but again, like some things never change. Like Sevilla won the uh, Europa League last season, right? Uh, or uh, am I messing up the t- timelines? Yeah, well, it's Sevilla. They yeah. might have might well have done it. So yeah, yeah. So they, they might have well have done, done that. So yeah, I think uh, the atmosphere uh, is obviously a lot different uh, in in front of their home fans, in front of their home atmosphere. They're, they're a different beast. They they took off one point from us uh, in one of their worst stretches during the season. I think the, uh, Diego Alonso left the club without. Uh, doing much i think he only won a couple of games in his in his two or three month stint and in that in that time he took one like a couple of points off real madrid and so at the bernabeu i would have expected things to be very good for us but then again we have to keep in mind that our team is also decimated by injuries at the moment there's going to be there's going to be no jude there's going to be no hoselu in attack 
And Hozelu's absence in this game particularly might be significant for us. And why that is, we will, we will obviously discuss that later in this part. Uh, Sam, you're going to be at the game tomorrow. You also covered Ancelotti's press conference today. Did anything stick out to you from his press conference today that you thought might be useful for, for analyzing tomorrow's game? Yeah, I mean, there was there were well one for tomorrow's game and one more long term, and one of those was uh, regarding tomorrow's game was about Arda Goulet, um, and he was kind of asked what is it that Arda has to do to start getting minutes, start playing more, and Ancelotti said that he's good enough to be starting to be playing games. It's just that he has so much competition around him, um, and for him to come out and kind of say he's good enough to be a starter, maybe that's a hint that he could be getting more minutes in the next few weeks. I think I'd be a bit surprised if he was to start tomorrow, but maybe he can come off the bench and have some kind of impact there. Um, and the other question, which I found quite interesting with Ancelotti today, was kind of uh, a hidden question about Mbappe, because we know that Ancelotti won't ever talk about Mbappe. But it was about Vinicius, and he was asked kind of, what is Vinicius's best position? How does he fit into that front line? Does he have to be on the left? And, and Ancelotti kind of went into quite a bit of detail talking about how he's improved this season coming inside, how naturally he comes inside a lot more than he was last season, uh, but that he's still most comfortable kind of on that left wing, which is interesting when we think about if Mbappe does come, how will that front two, front three look and how that could figure out. But obviously regarding tomorrow's game, it was all about Ardu Guler. There were a few questions about him. Uh, Antonio Rudiger, he confirmed that he would start tomorrow, which is obviously going to have a, an impact on that back four when there's not many options or choices in terms of who's going to be playing in the middle, who's going to be playing at fullback. Um, and again, he praised Ferland Mendy. I think he called him the best defensive fullback in the Real Madrid squad, um, which is uh, some big words with Danny Carvajal in there as well. So uh, a few interesting uh, comments from Carlo. So uh, I agree with everything you said. I mean, there were more interesting things than I thought there were going to be from a pre green press conference like this. The Mendy thing, just to start with it, <clears throat> he had an interesting quote where he said, uh, <clears throat> just pulling up your Managing Madrid article, he says, Mendy can handle a two-on-one because he has Vinicius, who has a lot of offensive quality. So Mendy has a profile where he has everything and a lot of defensive quality to handle inferiorities in that position. And I just, I just kind of had a quick look at the future when I read that. And I thought about it, you know, these linked to Davies. And, and nobody loves Davies more than I do. Mehdi, you and I are Canadian. The, the idea of having Davies, a Canadian, play for Real Madrid, it's just mind-boggling. I Personally, I thought I was going to be the first Canadian to play for Real Madrid. That was 23 years ago. I was wrong. But it, it, to see actually see that happen would be incredible. Having said that, can you look at – and look, you guys wrote a great uh, piece – on you and Sid wrote a great piece about Alfonso Davies. It's pinned on the Managing Madrid website. Everyone listening to this should go over right after this podcast and read it. It's about Alfonso Davies and his profile and, and how he would fit. And, and it's a huge scattering report. It's, it's well over 2,000 words with a lot of data, a lot of graphs and charts, visuals. Go read it, please. I did think about like the balance of having someone like Mendy in the team next year when you're bringing in Mbappe and Vinicius. And it's not quite a front three of Messi, Neymar, Mbappe that does not defend at all. I think the spine of this team, the midfield spine, to back up the attack, plus the third attacker, whoever it is, whether it's Rodrigo, whether it's Jude, the defensive work rate, Brahim, is off the charts. And that's why PSG actually looked better when Di Maria took the place of one of those front three attackers. But I thought like, you know, given that we're going to be such an offensive loaded team, Mendy in a team like that actually makes sense. And we know Davies is not a defensive juggernaut. He's more akin to Marcelo in the sense that he wants to attack and he's, he's way better offensively than he is defensively. So I just thought of that. I don't, I don't know if we want to touch on it too much right now, but it's just something I thought of unless Mehdi, you, you, you know, you want to touch on your Davies scouting report and, and what you think of that. Yeah, I think uh, what he said about Mendy, if he is in the kind of form that he is this season, is a very useful player. And uh, uh, we also have to take factor in the uh, injuries and absences thing. Because even if you bring in Davies, Davies' health record is not, not 
very good either. Neither is Mendy's. So you'd assume yeah. that they will, if if the timing of those things align, they would both probably have enough game time. And then you have the assurance of Eduardo Camavinga on the back of it as well. So, yes, I think even if you bring bring in Davis, uh, I trust Ancelotti to work something uh, something out there. But it will be, like, hypothetically, it will be really interesting, like, if everyone is fit, Real Madrid versus Manchester City, uh, Champions League semi-final, who starts? Uh, those kind of choices would be would be interesting. But, yeah, of course, uh, for someone who's in Canada, I'm, I'm definitely going to root for Davies here. Uh just to go back to the point I made earlier about the Sevilla game, I, I did some small statistical scouting of Sevilla last night. And some of the things that came out interesting were Sevilla are fourth worst in terms of uh, XG against in this season in La Liga, uh, which is, well, fair. Like they've changed managers three times. They're so, overperforming it, right? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think yeah. so. So. In in terms of XG again, so they're they're fourth uh, in the league, uh, in fourth in the league in terms of being worse. I don't I don't mean like in terms of being good. In terms of being worse, they they're fourth in that list. However, there are some metrics where Sevilla is actually silently dominating La Liga, and no one has probably kept tabs on those. Like they're the third best in terms of touches in the attacking third. Uh, in terms of tackles in the d- defensive third and the attacking third, they're also third in that list too. That's kind of a bit of weird that they're dominating tackles in the attacking third and the defensive third and kind of doing not much in, in the mid third. Uh, so there are some metrics. Uh, I, I created a thread on Twitter last night on this. So there are some metrics that they are dominating. Uh, I was speaking about why Hosilu would be a big miss in this game because Sergio Ramos and Lloyd Bale, uh, they're two center backs. These two guys are just dominating in the air. Ramos dominating in the air is no surprise. So among all the La Liga defenders who have played at least a, a thousand minutes this season, uh, in terms of per 90 aerial duels won, both Bale and Ramos are within the top six defenders. So uh, in the entire league, Two from Sevilla center back pair, pairing are in the top six of La Liga in, in that metric, and Bade is actually when you talk about aerial duels win percentage, I think he's the best or the second best in in all of the league. Again, among the defenders who have played more than thousand minutes, so against this kind of a center back profile, uh, I think uh, Joselu would have been uh, a great asset to win those balls, win those second balls as well. So that's something we're definitely going to miss. And so if you think about our front line tomorrow, it's going to be Rodrigo, Brahim and Vinicius. There is absolutely no height there at all. Uh, we don't even have Jude. So that's something something to be worried about, I think. Sam, that's that that was something I was looking at too. Um, <clears throat> I think if Sevilla are going to give us problems, it's going to be through a set piece like that. Because keep in mind, I mean, I mean, and I don't know if Hozulu would have necessarily started this game anyway, but maybe he would have. But he also helps defensively on set pieces too in situations like this, and, and it's a bit of a miss. Um, so just to go through, Sam, do you want to give us also a quick update on all the uh, injury-related stuff? Bellingham's out yeah, still, just, Rudiger, etc. Yeah, we'll as well, with the, just on the Sevilla's aerial threat, I think they have the highest number of completed crosses per 90 in La Liga as well this season. So, awesome. yeah, we talk about Marcelo, but also having Rudiger back could be a big benefit. Because, I mean, Chalmin, he's been quite good in the air when he's been playing central defence. But having a guy who's spent his whole career in that position knows how to expect it and kind of engage in those battles could be a, a real benefit. So having him back is very good. Um, in terms of the injuries, the big update this week has been that Militao and Courtois have been back in, in training with the ball. Um, I haven't seen the, an eclipse or anything in Militao, but Courtois was going through like a proper training session, the same kind of thing as Kepa and, and Lunin were doing. And there have been a few reports coming out this week that Ancelotti is optimistic he might have Courtois available for the final few weeks of the season, which would obviously be a huge boost if there's still Champions League games going on then. Um, Jude Bellingham is still a little bit away. Uh, who else have we got? We've got Hoselu, who's going to be out for two to three weeks. Um, I mean, the list is is never ending at this point, isn't it? 
Um, but, I, I think that's the list, though. Like uh, ignoring the Alaba, you know, Militao, Courtois, those guys. I think I think that's 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 the list. I mean, Bellingham and and Rudiger were the two main ones, and then obviously Joselu. Um, Joselu yeah, dropped out of training this week. So yeah. Um. So Mariano, are we putting him down for a goal? Of Is course, it beyond anyway. him? <laughs> Is Mariano uh, healthy right now? I don't think so, no. No, uh, he has a foot injury. Mariano yeah. is healthy. Mar- <laughs> Do you guys <laughs> celebrate it if he had scored at the Bernabeu? I don't think so. Do we think he celebra- He would celebrate? Yeah, if, if he would celebrate if he had scored a goal at the Bernabeu against Real Madrid. He better not. That dude came up through Castilla, was <laughs> literally just left us. Uh, he better not. I saw Sergio um, Ramos said that he wouldn't celebrate if he scored, which I saw some yeah. severe fans quite angry given how much he celebrated scoring for Real Madrid at the Pizuata a few years ago. Ramos said before Sevilla faced Barcelona, he said he's going to try to do everything in his power to score in that game and he scored an own goal. So that's that's classic Sergio Ramos. Just, uh, just give me the perfect Ramos game tomorrow. Give me... Give me a big Real Madrid win, 5-1. Give me a Ramos goal, a non-celebration, and a red card. We happy. That's uh, the just. It would be a great Sunday if, if all those things lined up for us. Um, going back to Goulart for a sec, I just kind of envision, because when Ancelotti was talking about, look, this guy's good enough to start, and he has a lot of competition. I think both those things actually probably are true. In the end, none of this gets easier for him next year with more players coming. But I just, I just imagine, guys, if if you're to play tomorrow, it's probably going to be a situation not one we need to win. It's going to be when the game, if the game is put to bed at three 0 or something, I, I would guess. <clears throat> uh, all right, what what else did you guys have in terms of Sevilla scouting report? I'm curious. I just had a couple of so other things. So Sam already mentioned about the crossing thing. Not just per 90, I think Sevilla is the team uh, with most crosses in the penalty area this season. Uh, obviously, with like towering heads like Sergio Ramos and Bade, uh, you would expect that. And that has been like constant. They've changed managers three times, but they still play a lot of crosses. Uh, in terms of like bright spots in their attack, Suso is a name that we should be wary of because, like, uh, again, in all of midfielders and forwards who have played at least 1,000 minutes in La Liga this season, Suso has the high, uh, second highest live ball shot creating actions. Uh, so he creates a lot of shots with from open play, not just from set pieces and stuff. And that's per 90. A surprising name, that list is topped by Luka Modric. Probably it's not a surprise. Luka Modric can do that. Uh, and he has played more than 1,000 minutes as well. So, yeah, Suso is someone who would, we want to be worried of, worried of in attack. Uh, something that was interesting to me when I was kind of looking at the analytics, the underlying analytics for Sevilla, is that they're about dead even in passes per defensive action, pretty much league average in their press. But they're third in tackles in the final third and third behind Real Madrid and Barcelona in touches in the attacking third. And I'm and I and I'd be curious, kind of like how that differentiates between home and away for them. But uh, it was just something that caught my eye. And it's a team that generally does like to go forward and get touches in the attacking third. And it's a team that doesn't really like to press much. But I think they 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 will probably be more conservative tomorrow. I mean, I, I think it would kind of suit us if they were obviously op- ready to open the game like that, which I doubt they would. They know our weaknesses in, in set pieces offensively and defensively. They know that we hate and and I don't know like the thing with because Sam you mentioned earlier Kike's uh, knack for trying to close the space and making it a difficult difficult game. That's how you like. That's how you should play Real Madrid. If mm-hmm. you're an opposing coach heading into this, the last thing you want to do is is do what uh, you know what Barca did and more examples of this in La Liga where where teams should just take a page out of what Atletico do is frustrate, stay compact, hit on the set piece, hit on the rare counter, 
and closed space, the moment you you try to take the game to us, especially as the burnabouts, it's a recipe for disaster. So I, I imagine that Sevilla will approach it more conservatively uh, tomorrow than they do at home. Uh, yeah. I think it will almost be like the Valencia game they had last week was like an, an audition, a practice training session for this weekend. Yeah. They only had one one shot that was in the 92nd minute and they kind of effectively did that, looked to shut, shut up shop and just defend and were happy to settle for a draw. And I think it worked for them against Valencia, against Real Madrid. It's obviously going to be a much tougher task, but I think it's going to be a very similar approach from, from Sevilla. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned the aerials. I don't I forget if you mentioned this specific thing, but they're also third in La Liga and the percentage of aerials they win. Um, what's a key matchup for you, Mehidi, heading into this game? What's something that we should be worried about, apart from the ramos Bade thing, which you already mentioned? Anything else? I think uh, the key matchup would be uh, in our defense, would probably in, in set pieces. Chuamini is going to play center back tomorrow, right? Rudiger's out. So it's going to be Chuamini and Nacho. No, Did they. Uh, going to Ancelotti today. Yeah. I, and so. Did they release this the match day squad yet? They probably did it like as we were recording yeah. or just before we hit recording. Yeah, Rudiger's really goes in there. Um, yeah, Vince, yeah, it was Lucas, yeah. Rudiger, yeah. Nacho. Rudiger in there, he's yeah. gonna is in there to play. So, but if, but did Ancelotti confirm today that Rudiger was gonna start? He said he'd start. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, here you go. Yeah, Rudiger is very good. He will start tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Like I knew, I'm pretty. Sh- I was pretty sure he was going to make the squad. I just wasn't sure if he was going to come off the bench or start. So there you go. Rudiger and Nacho is going to be the starting center back pair. Yeah. Uh, in the, in that case, yeah, I think the matchup is going to be from ES at this uh, Rudiger versus Ramos, Rudiger versus uh, Bade, Nacho versus Bade or Ramos already frightens me. Uh, Ancelotti should give it a go and probably see how Rudiger and Chuameni work. I think they played together for a game too, and that's when like Chuameni put out that tweet that don't he said to Rudiger, "Don't get used to it." <laughs> and then yeah, Ancelotti made him a center back anyway. And so, and and any any questions or concerns about like people saying, "Well, Chuameni should start over Nacho." I think Ancelotti put to bed pretty clearly in in one of the press conferences where he said, "If Nacho is healthy." He's going to start. Chuomeni is not going to play center back unless there's nobody else to play it. And uh, you mentioned Rudiger versus Ramos. I just remembered the altercation they had yeah. at the Pijuan, which was fantastic. It was great, great to see two complete, I don't know what you call them, mentality monsters, psychos, just going at it. But Rudiger even, versus Ramos, part two. Even in that altercation, like uh, Ramos was holding Rudiger's cheeks like Rudiger is a baby. Uh, and that's kind of like, that was kind of metaphoric. Like even in this, <laughs> in that world of altercations between defenders, Rudiger is a literal baby to Sergio Ramos. So uh, yeah, that was, that was funny. Just imagine the two of them playing together. It would have been absolute uh, chaos. Yeah. So, any other key matchups that you had, Sam? I think it could be interesting with Isaac Romero, who's been playing with Kike Sanchez Flores a lot. He's, he's scored three goals since he's come into the team, and he's been quite effective. Um, I feel like they're going to try and push him a little bit more onto Nacho. Um with Enazeri, he's going to be the big physical threat. So I think it makes sense that Rudiger is going to be monitoring him quite closely. But Romero does have that little bit of pace that maybe he could catch out Nacho um, if Nacho is playing how Nacho has been playing the last few weeks. Um, so I feel like those two finding the right balance as well, even in open play, not just the set pieces, is going to be important. But I think the service that gets up to those two in attack is going to be quite limited anyway. So... It's not too big a concern for Real Madrid, but I do think Isaac Romero might be a little bit more of a threat than than we give him credit for. So, uh, do we want to run down the starting lineups tomorrow? So we got uh, Kepa. No, Carvajal. Yeah. sorry, oh, man. I, I, I'll tell you why I just said Kepa. I'll <laughs> tell you why. I was it was a slip. I apologize. I was while we were doing this, I was reading a tweet from managing Madrid about Kepa. Because today is the five-year anniversary of the Kepa Carabao Cup fiasco where he told Sadi, I'm not coming off. 
So managing Madrid posted a video of it and I was watching, I was like, it was, I was looking at it as I was talking and I said, Kepa, I apologize. It's, I know it's unbelievable. Five years. Can you believe that? I can't believe the poor bears had that bad a time for the last five years. (laughs) He hasn't had one lucky break. Unreal. Uh, Yeah. February 24th, 2019, five years ago and not one year ago. So Lunin, Carvajal, Rudiger, Nacho. I think it'll be Mendy. And well, uh, Carvajal is suspended. Carvajal suspended. Carvajal, and who's the other one suspended? Is it Kamavinga, right? Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, so Lucas, sorry, my apologies. I'm all over the place. Lucas, Rudiger, Nacho, Mendy. And then you got probably too many back to midfield. Cruz, Valverde, Vinny, Rodrigo, Brahim. Picks itself, right? Yeah. Um do we do we feel like entertaining the Sevilla Sevilla starting eleven? Sure. Do you want to take a crack at it? Any I takers? With Nyland in goal in the last few weeks, then Bade Ramos uh and Kike Salas has been kind of the back three. Jesus Navas on the right. Uh, Lucas Ocampos, I think, is fit again. They had an injury worry there, but I think he's in the squad, so I think he'll probably play. Uh, Sumare So and Oliver Torres, and then Isaac Romero and Enazeli up front, I think. The one key matchup, and you know, when whenever I do these preview shows with Jose, it tends to be, and it didn't really come up today, but it one of the key matchups tends to be Vinicius versus X right back. So we got uh, Jesus Navas still chugging along at the age of whatever age he is, well into his, he must be, is it late 30s now? 38. 38, crazy. These guys, man, like people like him, Joaquin, Moro, I have so much respect for these guys. The longevity is insane. So, What's uh, the coverage like with Bade and Navas versus versus Vinicius? I imagine Bade is going to come over a lot on that side to double up to make sure Vinicius doesn't have much cut in space. Uh, yeah, that's that's Navas a key matchup, I think. Quite, regardless, yeah, Navas is quite quick, uh, so I feel like he can keep up with Vinicius. Which I mean, at thirty eight, he might not be able to keep up with Vinicius for the whole ninety minutes, uh, but at least in the first half, he. He's somebody who can keep up the pace. He's not going to be skinned alive like Vinicius does with some fullbacks. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Well, I think we, we covered most of the what's, um, you know, might go down tomorrow in terms of key matchups, in terms of how both these teams approach the game, both, both with their 11, their tactics. Uh, we went through the injuries and suspensions. Uh I got not much else. I got Leverkusen and, or sorry, I got Leipzig and Bayern in the background, zero zero. And I think I'll just go watch the rest of that. I don't know. Do you guys have anything else you guys wanted to hit that we missed? Not much from me. Yeah, Sam. Sam, you will be you will be at the burnabout tomorrow. Yes. Uh, you got to go early, man, because. They do the, you know, when the 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 speaker guy, the guy who announces the lineups and stuff, he'll announce the Sevilla lineup before the game. You want to hear the reaction. You also want to see what it's like when Sevilla come out on the pitch for their warm ups and the rea- and the and the Ramos reception. You want to be there for that. You want to document all that. You're gonna send it to me. I'll post it on managing with your socials, all that stuff. I hope you can uh, get a nice cozy seat. And you're there early, and you enjoy it. I'm jealous. Yeah, I'm yeah. jealous you're at that one, bro. It's very cold in Madrid this weekend. <laughs> not not Canadian cold, but very cold for Madrid cold. Um, so I will be there with my big coat on, uh, and nice and early to try and see that reception for Sergio Ramos. And I think there was there was some talk that there will be some kind of tribute to Sergio Ramos before the game that hasn't been revealed or any details, but there will be some kind of tribute to Sergio Ramos. Um, so it'll be good to see him get that reception and be welcome back because for me he left like not that long ago but the last time he played at the Bernabeu was that classic go in 2020 just before Covid because obviously after that every game before he left was at the Di Stefano so 
this is going to be the first time in in four years that he's played at the Bernabeu, which is crazy. Are they going to have a TIFO? I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be a TIFO, if it's going to be something official from the club at a presentation. I don't know what the plan is, um, but it could it could be a TIFO. Oh, be, by the uh, way, the Villa put out a statement of like Real Madrid making videos against. I the saw Real. that. <laughs> So Sevilla actually filed a complaint officially to La Liga about Real Madrid TV's videos and their insistence, insistence of, of putting pressure on the refs. Uh, do we have any thoughts on that? I don't look. I, I have said it before. I don't like that Real Madrid TV does that. Um, but I I had trouble understanding what the complaint was and why it came from Sevilla randomly. When La Liga is fully aware of them, but so what was it that they're actually trying to point out all of a sudden? Yeah, and Madrid probably just like they were saying they're being respectful uh, to Sevilla in terms of doing the Ramos tribute and everything. And uh, at that time comes the Sevilla statement. So yeah, I would be really happy if Madrid just blows all that out and like gives a huge photo Ramos and uploads an extra long video about the referee, <laughs> probably <laughs> in slow mo. So yeah, that that would be fun to watch. So yeah, I mean, it's hard to imagine what Sevilla hope to achieve by complaining. Like, yeah, okay, maybe the the federation will turn around and say Real Madrid, you should stop doing this. Um, but <laughs> other than that, uh, they can't go back in time and stop anything happening from this game. So. Yeah, it does seem a bit random, but Sevilla, Sevilla put out quite a harsh statement against Barcelona with the Negreira case earlier in the season as well. And I guess that's kind of what Sevilla has, is that you know the teams that have been critical of Real Madrid TV doing this have been Atleti, Barca, and Atleti, Barca always going to be, you're only saying that because it's Real Madrid and you don't like Real Madrid. Sevilla, I guess, are a little bit more neutral in that sense, and they've already criticised Barcelona, now they can criticise Real Madrid. They're just <laughs> going crazy, blaming everybody for everything, but... And I mean, the the other funny thing uh, is perhaps the referees that will be in charge this weekend is uh, Diaz Medera, who's had more uh, on-field refereeing mistakes than any other official this season in La Liga, oh, which is not a yeah. that you want to have. And then the VAR is Gonzalo, Gonzalo Fuertes, uh, who is probably the worst referee I've ever seen in the top division of any <laughs> league. So to have those two, I think this is the one time where Real Madrid TV probably can have some complaints about the referees, but it's the one time that Sevilla decided to complain. One thing I'm I'm admittedly not good at is differentiating the referees. Like I think like some people just know like who who Hernandez Hernandez is or like this Montuera guy. Like they know the face to the name. To me, it's just one blur of of badness. Just one blur of they are all one face one name i don't know which one's which and they all suck that's that's how i view it so every time it's like oh this guy's in charge i'm like he's like i'm amazed you know who's in charge all i know is that whoever's in charge is gonna suck that's that's all that's the only thing i know for sure that's the only thing i know uh yeah that that, that was that was it like I, I saw the statement i was like okay so what's what are you doing bringing attention to it when we already know it exists I, it just felt like it really random to me. I wasn't sure what the outcome was. Um, and I and I just had to fact check you, Sam, when you said it's cold in Madrid. It's actually, you're not wrong. It's going to be cold tomorrow. Cloudy and going to be between three and eight degrees. I, I was there last week. I was blown away. I was like, what the hell? This is a different planet. Like, I was in Retiro Park doing sprints. There was people running without their shirt. There were flowers blooming. It was like 16 degrees. I'm like, what is this? I was like, this is winter. This is amazing. Uh, so as much as I complain about... Tuesday was 20 degrees. And now tomorrow is going to be, yeah, colder. So, I mean, it, it's not cold. But for Madrid, it's it's relatively cold. So I wonder if we're going to have the roof on at the Bernabeu tomorrow as well, um, which the roof has been on for pretty much all of the home games in the last few weeks. So I that's think so unfair of us, man, to put the roof up. It's, it's such a big advantage for us. It's like having 10 extra players on the field. It's, it's such a disadvantage for all these opposing teams. 
I know Again, the Real Madrid did, did, TV, the roof on is just a whole different competition. The roof, the crowd, the, it's like the, the complaints about the roof are, are truly, truly like put that in, in a museum some, somewhere. There's complaints about grass, okay, brutal, but okay, it's grass, wind, okay, it's nature, what do you want? But the roof being closed, complaining about the roof is is on another level. Um I was just thinking, I, I know like we were going to wrap it up like 10 minutes ago, but I was just thinking about the last Sevilla game at the Pijuan. Curious, did you guys, do you guys have, I'm not like, just not to put you on the spot, but do you guys remember anything noteworthy from that game that like troubled us? I think the most memorable thing for me was what Mahedi said earlier about Rudy going to Ramos. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Messing around. That was the most memorable moment. I remember. Who scored in that game for us? Was it Vinicius or Bellingham? I think it was either of those two. So, I had to I had to revisit my notes for that game. I, I'm I'm looking at them now, and it was a game where people were really frustrated with Rodrigo because it was during the Rodrigo slump and he was missing some chances, and. Uh, it ended 1-1. Carvajal scores four minutes after Alaba scores an own goal. I don't know oh, if yeah, you remember those two things bit. happening or not. Oh, but yes, yes. Like Two disallowed goals in the first half early on as well, weren't they? Yeah. And, wow. and, and in that game, Rudiger had one insane long pass over the top to Vinicius, which was just like peak Chelsea Rudiger ball progression. He beat the entire Sevilla backline and put the ball on a plate for Vinicius uh, on a basically a breakaway one on one. But it was it was a tough game to create meaningful chances, and it's it's obviously just going to be different different at the Bernabeu. It always is, but but it was it wasn't easy at the at the Pige one. Um, all right, guys, I'm going to suggest we wrap it up yeah. here. Sorry, well, one go ahead. More thing, yeah, yeah. Time. This is the first time since the 2nd of September, if we ignore the international breaks, the winter break, it's the first time since the 2nd of September where there's been mm-hmm. three league games for Real Madrid without a midweek match day or a Copa del Rey or a Champions League. The first time there's been seven days rest and then a game and then another seven days rest since Incredible. the 2nd of September. I don't know what to do with myself. There's so, there's so much break, so much rest. Like you got like Sam, you're probably pretty busy at into the Calderon. Like, have Atletico been playing midweek? Well, Atletico had Champions yeah, League the, last week. And everything, but yeah, I mean, usually I'm used to being very busy at this time of the year with with Real Madrid and going out. Yeah, Copa del Rey was uh, freed up some time. I'm used yeah. to Atletico usually going out very early in those competitions. So. <laughs> A change yeah. this year. I mean, it's it's uh, really great for us to have this right now with our injuries too. Really great. Um, it helps. Every bit helps. All right. Sam, enjoy the game tomorrow. Enjoy going to the stadium. Bayern just scored against Leipzig. Um, we'll be back tomorrow here live on YouTube right after the final whistle. Um, and we're basically... It, it's hard to schedule it exactly, but we schedule it generally two hours after the game starts. So... I think the game's at 9 p.m. if I'm not mistaken, which means the post-game podcast live on YouTube will be scheduled for 11. If it doesn't start right at 11, we'll just try our best. We'll try to either start early if and if it's past 11, just as close to 11 as possible. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult because we're also working during the game. We're also working right after the game as well. So we'll try our best, but around 11 p.m. Madrid time, fire up YouTube, fire up. Uh, the YouTube channel and, and see us live. If you join this one late live, you can always go back and listen to it or watch it later. It'll be posted. The whole thing will be posted. Um, Mehedi, thanks, man. I appreciate you, Sam. Thank you for tuning in. Enjoy the game tomorrow. Chat later, guys. Peace out.